Where else would you rather be than in a place where God, the God of this universe would make this unbelievable promise? If you draw close to me, I will draw close to you. Amen? That's why we're here, right? Oasis and everybody else, that's, that's why we're here. Like, we, we, we're talking about a God who says, if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. Amen? Well, I have the privilege, nay, the honor of introducing uh, one of our preachers tonight. Um, we don't call them speakers at Oasis. I mean, we, we have speakers, but there are these things on these poles right here. You know, those are speakers. We, we, we have preachers who preach the word of God. Amen? Preach the word of God. So uh, we got a special guy tonight, and I got it written down here so I don't, so I don't forget some of these things. I, I made a list of, uh, of some of his accomplishments here. I just want to brag on him so you don't have to brag on yourself, Doc. Okay, so uh, uh, Dr. Wheeler serves as the professor of women's ministry. Oh, I'm sorry, of evangelism uh, at Liberty University and Theological Seminary. He's dedicated to training and equipping students. He has, he has over three years of ministry experience. Um, sorry, wait, that's 30, 30 years of ministry experience. Um, when I first met him, one of the first impressions was this dude is committed to being a phenomenal dad. That's one of the very first impressions that he made in my life before I heard him preach or anything else. I was like, this dude loves his family. And so I knew I could, I could look to him in that way uh, before I heard anything else or saw him as other abilities. He's, he's, uh, he's served the church. He's, he's planted churches. He's trained students. And one thing I love about Doc is he keeps it real. Um, he's, he's not into religiosity. He's into Jesus. And he's into how does, how does the God of this universe make, it, make himself practical in your life? And I just love that, right? Who has time for fluff? Let's get real. Life's short. Let's go, right? Well, that's Dr. Wheeler, and I'd love to have you come now, brother. But right before you do, we have a short video. So if you turn your eyes to the screen. Hello, my name is David Wheeler. I am the regional manager of the Elia Shepherd office and also the evangelism department here at Liberty University. And guess what? I, I got a little few little toys here I'll show you. I, I love Krispy Kreme donuts, and I was once a, a bodybuilder. Isn't that kind of cool? Yeah. I said, and hey, this truck brings lots of Krispy Kremes to you. Somebody gave me that. And I'm not sure exactly what this is, but it's kind of cool because a student gave it to me. And I really love Batman, as you can see. I, I love it a lot. In fact, my favorite verse is right here. Go therefore and all the world and make disciples. And that's Jesus who said that. I love teaching, but more than that, I love working in the office. That was a coffee house video we did uh, a few years ago. I've done about 30 of those. It was fun. <laughs> I did one as a dance video. Don't you ever look that one up, okay? <laughs> it was fun, though. No. It's good to be with you tonight. I really appreciate the opportunity. Didn't the worship guys do a great job, man? I'm telling you. Thank you so much. I have the best job in the world getting to work with our students and, and being a part of that. And so what, what I want to do tonight is just get right to the point and I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer that I want us to get started. I'm going to talk about tonight about three kinds of people in this place, and every one of us will fit into one of those categories. So let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you. We ask you, Father, that right now that your Holy Spirit would lead in this time. I ask God right now, Lord, that uh, your Holy Spirit would just, just touch our hearts, Father. If there's anyone here, Father, that doesn't know you, I pray they, they will before the night's over. If there's some of us here, Father, that are just playing games, I pray we'll stop that as well, and I pray, Father, you'll draw us back to where we need to be. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Three kinds of people, three kinds of people. Real simple, Matthew chapter 7, we're going to read verses 21 through 27. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day of judgment, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied your name? Uh, in your name, 
Excuse, I'm sorry, my scripture went away. Have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Verse 23, and then I will declare to them that I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Have you ever asked the question, you know, have you ever asked yourself, do you want to go to heaven? Do all of us here want to go to heaven, yes or no? Come on, do we really want to go to heaven, yes or no? Come on. I mean, considering the alternative, I would think that all of us here would say, yes, I want to go to heaven. But we need to understand there's a key question to this that goes along with it. That is, is everyone going to heaven? Unfortunately, no. Scripture says this. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, we need to understand why that's so. Before you begin to say that God is some kind of, you know, uh, uh, it's just not fair that everybody's not going to go there. I mean, but, but you understand it. We're not trying to fulfill our standard. We're trying to fulfill God's standard. God's standard of perfection and righteousness and holiness demands that there has to be a sacrifice because we can't do it on our own. How many of you heard people say, I'm a good person, right? You heard people say that, right? And we judge ourselves based upon that. I was thinking this the other day. I've been in ministry actually over 40 years, Brady. And I, I have uh, preached probably three to 500 funerals in that time. You know, and I've, I've never had anyone come up to me and go, you know what, they just were a lousy human being. They're going straight to hell. Now, most people generally will come up to you and say, oh, my brother, my, my mom, my aunt, my uncle, my sister, whoever it is, oh, they were really, really sweet people. You know, man, I mean, they, they just, they, they, you know they're going to go to heaven. And the reality of it is, the hard part, and Bubba, you've been doing this a long time, you know about this, the hard part is to stand over someone like that and actually preach a funeral knowing that, that's, that it's not determined on whether what their family says. I mean, come on, I've had people stand up and tell me, Dr. Wheeler, tell me when I was pastoring, David, if you go up there and try to preach them to heaven, God will, God's literally going to send a bolt of lightning and knock you out of the pulpit. Because you can't do that, can you guys? It's not about just being a good person. It's not just about living you know, a nice life. It's not about kissing your, 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 your kids and your, your spouse and, and loving on your animals and all this kind of stuff or, or whatever. It's not about any of that. There, there's, a, there's, a, there's a price here. There's a, there's a path here that has to take place. And I know that some of us don't want to have to deal with that. And we've, made, we've rationalized in our mind that we're okay, we're set. In fact, I was talking to a, a student today, and she was telling me about her dad. She said her dad got saved when he was about eight or nine years old, and, and he's not living that way and hasn't lived that way. She said her whole, almost literally since she was a kid, she's really never seen him live like he was an actual Christian. And so she went to have a conversation with him this last week, and what he said was, he said, man, I checked off that box a long time ago. He said, I got saved a long time ago. I don't have to worry about that anymore because that's taken care of. He said, I can pretty much live the way I want to live. It really don't matter. Now, guys, does Scripture teach that, yes or no? I remember being, being in, when I was in Indiana one time, and I, uh, I, we were going door to door, and I went to this house, and I asked this guy, I said, I just got one question to ask you. I said, if you died right now, and you were to stand before God, and he would ask you, right before you go into the gates, you know, why should, I let you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? He said, well, I would tell God, he better let me, let me into heaven for all the things I've done for him. So I, I moved back because I knew the bolt was coming. <laughs> Here's what I want you to understand. Guys, we're not saved because we, we said a prayer when we were seven years old. We're not saved because we've been a member of a church all of our life. We're not saved because we're good people. We're not saved because we're church members. We're not saved because we're baptized. We're not saved for any of those things. That's not what this is. Guys, there's only one way that we can be redeemed. And the scripture is very, very plain about this. I think all of us want to go to heaven. You, you would have to be crazy not to want to go to heaven. Come on, I've, I've thought a lot about what's going to be in heaven, right? You just saw it just a moment ago. I know the only hot thing in, in heaven is going to be the hot sign for Krispy Kreme, right? <laughs> yeah. In fact, I've told my students, I said, guys, I love what I do. I love what I get to. And here's, here's the deal. If I died right now, I, I, don't worry about that. I don't want you to come and cry over my grave. 
I want y'all to go to Krispy Kreme and get dozens and dozens of donuts and a bunch of yoo-hoos and have a party right there, okay? Because that's what I'm going to be doing in heaven, right? Bottom line here is this. We don't know exactly what heaven's going to be like, but we know who's going to be there, right? And we need to understand this. We're, that is not determined by the fact that we grew up in a Christian family. It's not determined by any of those things. It's determined why? Because of Jesus Christ. So what I want you to do tonight is I want you to take an honest opportunity to look into your life, every one of us. I don't care if you're a pastor, Brady. I don't care if it's Bubba, who's been, what it is. I don't care any of us here. I want us to take an honest look because here's, here's the thing. Many of us here can remember revivals when preachers used to preach straight to the heart and they would ask for commitment and they weren't scared to say, thus saith the Lord, right? That's what we need. We need prophets to stand up and speak the truth. Guys, we got a culture that is offended by the, by the holiness and righteousness of God because we worship our own righteousness and holiness. And we need to stop getting offended by God and start getting offended by our own righteousness because that's not going to get us anywhere. So I want us to take an honest look tonight inside of us. Because listen, I've seen this over and over again. Man, we can hide, we can look like, man, we got it all figured out. And then we go right in front of our computer when we get home and we're looking at porn all night. There's a thousand different things I could name right now that we do that with, guys. I mean, seriously. I mean, we, we, talk, we, we tell Jesus and raise our hands how much we love him. And then we talk about everybody we can right when we're behind their back. Guys, we need to be honest as to why our culture is dying. Let's just be real here. It's because the church has been dying. The church has been dying. We, it's just the truth. We, the church has been dying. Guys, we have been called a post-Christian nation for 25 years by anybody who understands the statistics. We, we realize, guys, in the late 90s, in the late 90s, North America was the only continent where Christianity was not growing. So we need to understand the church is dying. The church is dying here. And we, we don't, what we don't need, guys, is this, this kind of mansy-pansy kind of thing. We need to get down to it where it is, get back on our faces before God, and ask God to forgive us. And we need to repent. So let's talk about this. What does this mean? There's three types of people, okay? Most importantly, again, be honest. Which one are you? In other words, who's going to go to heaven? First of, all, first of all, who's going to go to heaven? Look what the scripture says. It says, he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. It doesn't say, he who goes to church. He who teaches Sunday school class. He's a deacon. He's a pastor. It says, he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Guys, think about this for a moment. Statistics have consistently said now for the last 40, 50 years that 90% of Christians will die having never shared their faith one time. But yet Acts 1.8 is very plain when it says, you'll receive the power of the Holy Spirit and you will be my witnesses. First in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the world. Does that not sound like a command of Scripture, yes or no? So, but yet we choose to not speak about Jesus every single day. We disobey God in those kinds of ways because we like to choose and pick what makes us feel comfortable. Let me tell you why you don't feel comfortable sharing your faith. You don't feel comfortable sharing your faith because it's spiritual warfare. God, God, God listen, literally, it is good news, but Satan knows it is good news, and he will do everything he can to dissuade us, so he makes it feel unnatural. Come on, guys, right, think about this. I've got three grandchildren. Y'all want to see pictures? I'll show you pictures. I'll lose my, 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 my grandpa card if I don't show y'all pictures. I, I'll throw you my phone if you want to see it, all right? How hey, many grandparents here? Come on. How many of y'all will throw the, show the pictures of your grandkids all the time? Come on. Do you ever hesitate in showing the pictures of grandkids? No, I get more of them to show. I got videos I'll show you. Come on, is that not true? Why are we so quick to show the pictures of our grandkids? Because that's good news, but we, we, we're so hesitant to share the good news of the gospel. Are we afraid we'll be rejected? Yes, that's, a, that's an honest thing. But if we trust the Holy Spirit, come on, how many of y'all believe in the Holy Spirit in this place? 
Okay, let me ask you something. Can you believe in something you do not trust? Look right here. There's a chair right here. I can choose to sit in this chair or not sit in this chair. You know, if I say I believe this chair will hold me up, then I have to sit in it to prove that. Is that true? Come on. You get on an airplane. You say, I, I believe that airplane will fly. But you don't really believe it until you get on the airplane and you fly, right? That's what we have to understand. The same thing's true of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1 says, God will give us the power of the Holy Spirit, and then you will be my witnesses. God is not saying, go out there and do this on your own. He is saying, let me use you as a conduit of my spirit to speak through you, and all you have to do is be a willing host of my spirit. Yet there's people in this place tonight who've been Christians for 40 and 50 years and have never walked through the full gospel with anyone ever. And now you're feeling bad. Well, that guy made me feel guilty. No, that's not me. That's the Holy Spirit trying to get a hold of our hearts because we have convinced ourselves that we make a really good usher, but we can't share the gospel. We make a really good children's worker, but we can't share the gospel. We're really good at working in the kitchen, but we can't share the gospel. The reality of it is, if we can't share the gospel, what are we doing the other things for? We're doing that for the gospel's sake. Every one of us can share the gospel. My daughter, Kara, you know, they can tell you all about my daughter, Kara. Kara has mild cerebral palsy. She has a speech impediment. She didn't walk till she's four and a half years old. The doctor said she would never be able to function, do anything. She graduated high school in the National Honor Society, graduated from Liberty University in 2013. And that girl has, has, has went to the Philippines six months later, sharing the gospel, can't even drive a car. She's four foot 11, about 100 pounds. You tell me you can't share the gospel. You meet Kara first. Guys, the word boldness in Scripture is an interesting word because it means to be set free. Listen to this carefully. Paul uses the word boldness over and over again. Do you know where Paul uses the word boldness most of all? When he is in prison. Now catch this. Paul is in prison but yet they had to change the guards out all the time because Paul was leading the guards to Christ and they were sending him out as missionaries literally all over the world. Paul, who was in chains, was set free with the gospel. Look at this. We who are free choose to live in chains and be silent. Explain that one. How does that happen? We've allowed that to happen. Who's going to be there? Those who do the will of the Father in heaven. God's not asking for, for how I read that verse. God's not asking how you read that verse. You know what the will of the Father is. That we be like Him. That we take the gospel to the world. That we're willing to die. This is what I tell my students all the time. If we're not willing to die for our faith, we'll never be willing to live for our faith. Problem is, nobody wants to die anymore. We put it on preachers. Everybody else, it never was meant to be that way. You know what the point of the preacher is? To equip the saints to do the same work of ministry we're talking about here. It's for all of us. So who's going to be there, number one? Those who do the will of the Father. How about number two? Who may not be there? Who may not be there? I, I, I call them the terminally religious. Let's read what it says here. Verse 22. It says, many will say to me in that day of judgment, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Who's not going to be there? The terminally religious. But Lord, I've done all these things in your name. God, I've worked in church, you know. Lord, I even worked a three-year-old nursery. Can you believe that? <laughs> Anybody have ever worked a three-year-old nursery? <laughs> Let me give you a word now, how to build up your three-year-old nursery. This is the honest to God truth. If you want to know all the gossip of the church, work in the three-year-old nursery. <laughs> it's the truth. It's the truth. Those kids will tell you everything and anything going on. I had one one day walk up to my wife and tell her about her mom and dad were taking a bath together the night before because she peeked into the bathroom. <laughs> well, we knew them because, because he later on was a deacon in our church. We told Ronnie and Donna, and they had just about died. <laughs> Those three, now everybody's going to volunteer for the three-year-old nursery, right? 
God, I've done everything for you. Lord, I've sacrificed. I've done this. I've done this. I've done this. And God's going to say, depart from me. I never what? Let me give you the etymology of that word new. K-N-E-W. If you want to take your notes, write this down. That word new was, is a transliterated word from the Hebrew, from the Old Testament, into the New Testament, into the Greek. And here's what it means. It meant to consummate a marriage. You remember in the Old Testament, it's, it would have a, they, a couple that would get married, and it said they knew each other. So there's not a more intimate phrase in all of Scripture than that one right there. So when he's telling them, depart from me, I never knew you. He wasn't saying, depart from me, for you never knew about me. Depart from me because you couldn't tell me the first five books of the Bible. He said, depart from me because you never intimately had a relationship with me. Look at me. Guys, it's not about knowing about God. It's about knowing God. Now, let me, let me share this with you. I see this a lot with my, my kids who go to Christian schools. And I love Christian schools. This is not being mean. This is being honest. They have a whole lot of what up here. The problem is they've never connected with the who that really gives us a relationship. Guys, you can have a lot of what up here, but we're not saved by the what. We're saved by the who, Jesus Christ. The terminally religious are the ones who connected with the church. They're ones who say, like that guy I talked about earlier, you know, I, I checked off that box earlier. The terminally religious. Guys, some of us in here tonight, that may be us. Maybe you are completely, you know without a doubt you're redeemed, but you're not living like it and you haven't been for a while and there's not been a fire burning in your soul for a long time for the gospel because you've allowed everything else to get in the way of it. I don't know about you. I want to be like this man named Orville. Orville Hyper. If you go to our basketball arena, you'll see his name on the floor at the Liberty Basketball Arena. Orville's son, Mark, is a good friend. He's a lawyer in California. And anyway, several years ago, I had their son, in, their um, Mark's son in class, Orville's grandson in class. What happened was 70 years of marriage, Orville's wife passed away. So Mark put his dad in a car, said, why don't we get out of here for a while? And rented a car and drove all the way across the United States several days together just to see what was the whole United States, everything going on, just to come to Liberty University so he could see his, his grandson who played basketball at Liberty. Anyway, when Mark showed up there, he came to my class. He brought his dad, Orville. Orville was 93 years old at the time. He'd been married to his wife 70 years when she died. He'd been in ministry 70 years. He planted six churches, mega churches, in the Los Angeles area. He was 93 years old in a senior adult center, and he planted his seventh church at 93 years old. Yes. When he died at 88, that church was still thriving. That's who I want to be. I don't want to ever learn, lose that fire. I don't want to ever get to that place where we're just being religious, where, it just, where we could just check off the boxes. No, there's a lot, too many terminally religious people in our churches who are not in love with God. They're just in love with the idea of God. They're in love with the idea of heaven, but they want to do it their way, not God's way. I got news for them. When that day comes, God's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. And that's going to be sad. Nobody takes joy in that because it shouldn't be that way. Guys, we, we, we don't ever do this in churches anymore. We never call Christians out and say, guys, we need to rededicate our life because we're afraid of stepping out and doing that because we're afraid people might think we've done something wrong. Listen, we've all done stuff wrong. We're all sinners. It shouldn't matter how old we are. What should matter is who he is. And may we never learn to lose that fire of what's burning inside of us. This is who we're supposed to be. Not the terminally religious. And thirdly, who will not be there? The unredeemed. 
Those who've never received Christ as their personal Savior. Who are they? Who are the unredeemed? They're people we know, maybe you, who have never fully obeyed Christ by repenting of their sin and receiving his free gift of forgiveness and salvation. Guys, we cannot come to Christ without repentance. I hear many of my students a lot of times share their testimony. They, they like to talk about how much God loves us. Let me ask you a question. Does God love us, yes or no? Absolutely, he loves us. But what's, what's Romans 5, 5, 8 say? It says, God commendeth his own love towards us that while we were yet, Christ died for us. We cannot understand the love of Christ unless we understand that God had to travel so far against his very nature to bring redemption to us because he who, who was no sin made himself that to take our place to the grave so he could come out of that and leave our sin there, death there, everything else there so we could have victory. But we don't have victory because we're such good people. We have victory because he's such an amazing God. And we need to understand how that works. We need to understand that the unredeemed, what does it mean? We need to repent of our sin. We need to realize, do you realize, I was told a couple of years ago that, that several denominations, you know, took, took about the word wrath out of about 10,000 songs in the songbook. Nobody wants to talk about the wrath of God anymore. Let me just say this to you. God's not changed his wrath. You can call it whatever you want to call it. But guys, sin is sin. We can't soften that. If it wasn't so bad, then why did Jesus have to die for it? That's the price he paid for us. We didn't deserve that. I know how despicable I am. And he saw me when he went to, went to the cross and to the grave and came out, but yet he still died for me the same way he did for you. The point is, are we willing to agree with him in our sin that we are sinners? Are we willing to surrender to the fact that we cannot save ourselves? Are we willing to finally say, God, I'm willing to turn away from my sin? You see, anybody here ever felt conviction before? Is conviction fun, yes or no? But do you realize conviction is one of the greatest acts of love in all of Scripture? It is. Come on, when my, if my grandson, my grandson spent the weekend with me. He's five years old. He's my namesake. I jokingly tell people he's going to help me start a prison ministry because I'm going to have to visit him there, okay? <laughs> but here, he, he's wild as he can be. But that kid, let's just imagine that my wife turns on the, uh, of the stove and he goes over there and he just wants to grab something and, and he's putting his hand up there to find out if it's warm, now I, if it's hot. Now, I got a choice at that point. I can say, yeah, I told him to stay away from there before. I, just let him burn his hand. He'll learn then, right? But he may never be able to use that hand again. Or should I, number two, scream and holler and yell, jump across the kitchen as fast as I can, and pull him back so he won't burn his hand? Which one's the right one? One or two? Two. 100 out of 100 times, right? That's exactly what I'm supposed to do. When we feel conviction of God, it's because God knows we're about to walk off a cliff that literally may destroy us or take us a place that we may never be able to overcome and face consequences that we will carry the rest of our life. If you love someone so much, would you not tell them the truth? Yes or no? That's what conviction is. God is saying, you're walking headstrong in this direction and some of us are doing this right now and we're about to walk off a cliff and God's saying, Man, I want to grab you because I want to save you before you destroy yourself. Repentance is once you feel that sense of conviction, you turn around and you walk in the opposite direction. You don't look back. And surrender is simply saying to God, God, I received Jesus Christ. I believe what he did. I believe he died for my sin. I believe he resurrected. And Lord, I ask him right now, you, Lord, if you would come into my life and save my soul. Why fight against that? That's the greatest act of love ever. Scripture says there's no greater act than to put, lay your life down for somebody else. And that's exactly what Jesus did for us. We like to sing about grace, but we need to think about grace more often. Because, guys, that grace is what paid the price for us. He had grace on us. 
Listen, if he gave that much for us, the least we could do is give everything back to him. Why do we choose to live in fear? Why do we choose to, to remove ourselves from that place of greatest blessing? The unredeemed. Verse 24 says this of Matthew. I love how they put this, God puts this back to back. He says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man. Remember this? Who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house. And it what? And it what? Say it one more time. And it what? For it was founded on what? Who's the rock? What's he saying here? He's saying, listen, the world is coming after you. There are those who will not be redeemed. It's because they're choosing to ground their life on anything else other than the rock. Verse 26 says, but everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. Listen, you have a choice tonight how you're going to build the rest of your life. Are you going to ground it upon pride because we're too scared to take a step forward because we're afraid what somebody else might think? Forget that. Or you're sitting here tonight and you've never received Christ and you're just like, well, man, I'm just not sure I'm going to give that another day. You've been, you've been throwing out that same lazy, just pointless a verse out for hundreds of years saying the same old thing over and over and over again and you know that you need more because your life is empty it's empty there's something missing in here there's something it's like a jigsaw puzzle with a piece inside that's just not there and it just don't look right it don't feel right there's because God created us with a vacuum to want to know him. And nothing will ever fill that vacuum until Jesus does. The very purpose of our life is to come in relationship with him. Young people understand that. The purpose of this life is not to get the most views or clicks or anything else. The purpose of this life is to be in relationship with holy God. And the sooner you realize that, the greater your life will be. The sad part about it is there's some of us older ones here tonight who are still struggling with that. We played games with God for a long time because we love to hold on to what we got. We love to hold on to the church and the world at the same time. And God's saying, man, you can't hold on to both because a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. You better let loose of the world. and You better grab hold of me. So tonight I'm speaking to those of you who do not know Christ. Here in a moment I'm going to go through exactly what you must do to receive Christ. But I'm also speaking to those of us who know Christ. If we really want revival to start in this community, revival must first start in us. And that means we need to get on our faces. We need to step out before God. We need to surrender ourselves completely to Him. We need to say, God, I'm sorry. This is what I've done. Lord, forgive me. Lord, take my heart that has been, been resistant to follow you out of fear and take my fear away, God. In the middle of, you may be shaking while you're doing this and say, God, not my will, but thy will be done. There is no greater prayer you can ever pray and no scarier prayer you can ever pray. But if you mean it, there's no other prayer that will change your life quicker other than the salvation prayer than to say to God, not my will, but thy will be done. Because I can promise you if you do that, God will take your life in places and directions you've never imagined. I was that kid who was in trouble all the time in school. There's not one of my elementary school teachers who ever thought I'd get out of elementary school. I'm telling you right now, it's the truth. I began to look at my report cards a few years ago, and I read the notes that they sent to my mom and dad, and I felt so guilty. I found their numbers and started to try to call them so I could apologize. It's the truth. I got a hold of Miss Knox. She was the first teacher I ever had in the fourth grade 
who actually acknowledged the fact that, that she, I, I'll never forget this. She came in, she was a Christian lady, and sure enough, true to form, she, uh, about the first week she was in class, I end up outside because I always spent my time in the hall. And so she was out there with me, and she looked at me, and she, for the first time I listened, and she looked at me, and she said, David, you're better than this. She said, I've met your mom and dad. They're good Christian people. What's wrong with you? She said, do you realize the first thing every teacher told me when they said I was going to take over this class is, you better watch out for that Wheeler kid. He will absolutely drive you nuts. She said, you're better than this. I'd never heard that before other than my mom and my dad. I called her a while back and let her know that I was in the ministry. And she said, you know, I'm not surprised. I said, you just lied. I know you were surprised. <laughs> really? If you saw that with me in the fourth grade, then you're a savant, okay? I mean, you're, you're a prophet, all right? That's just it. But here's the point I want to try to make with that. Is that, guys, it wasn't up to me to fix my life. It was up to me to surrender that to Christ and let him do that. It was God who took our life, who took this and made it what he wanted it to be. I wouldn't be standing here tonight without Jesus. There's no way in this world. And I believe with all my heart that God has things in store for some of you that you've not even thought about yet. Some of you, God's calling to full-time vocational ministry, and you've been running for years. I remember when I graduated seminary the first time, there was a 70-something-year-old man that graduated from seminary who'd been running for ministry for all those years, and God used him just like he did Orville in the last part of his life. Some of you, God's been calling you to certain things, and you need to say yes to him. Some of you, God's been calling you across the street, and you've been saying no way too long. Some of us here have placed our eternal des you know, destiny based on the simple fact that we prayed a prayer when we were a kid. Have we been growing? Are we walking with him? Is this just religion, or we, is it real? I'm telling us tonight, if we want to see revival in our community, we need to see revival first in the church. It's true. So I challenge you. What's God saying to you? How can you be saved? Be willing to hear and act upon Jesus' words. Agree with God that you are a sinner. Repent by the power of God. Turn away from your sin and follow Christ. Choose to believe that Christ paid the price for your sin on the cross and was resurrected from the dead. Start building your spiritual house upon the rock by completely surrendering your life to Christ as Lord. Stop arguing. No more than this. The answer is yes, God, whatever you want tomorrow. Lord, the answer is yes. Before I step into tomorrow, I'm not, Lord, the answer is yes. What does Romans 10, 9 says? If you will confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What does that mean? Is that magical words? No, it simply means a repentant heart that says, God, I feel your conviction. I'm going to turn and walk the other direction. And God, I'm not exactly sure what to say except I need you in my life. I repent of my sin. God, take my life. For those of us who are Christians walking in the wrong direction, we feel conviction as well. It means to turn back to God, get on our faces before God, ask God to forgive us and walk with us so we can be the children he wants us to be. Revelation 3, 19 through 21, simply says this. The people I love, I call to account. I prod and correct and guide so that they'll repent and turn from their sin. Upon your feet, then. About face, he says. Run fast after God. Verse 20 and 21 says, look at me. I stand at the door. This is Jesus speaking to us. I stand at the door and I knock. If you hear my call and open the door, I'll come in right in and sit down and supper with you. You, as conquerors, 
will sit alongside me at the head table, just as I, having conquered sin on the cross and resurrected from the dead, then took the place of honor at the side of my heavenly Father. That's my gift of salvation to you, the conquerors who trust me. That's who we're called to be. So I'm going to ask the guys to come on up tonight and get ready and just begin to play. And we got counselors here on both sides. And the fact of the matter is, it may be that some of the counselors tonight may need to come just to get before God and say, Lord, I just really need to get this right with you. If you've never received Christ as your personal Savior, I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads right where you are. All of us, bow our heads and just close our eyes. If you've never received Christ as your personal Savior, that simple prayer just goes like this. It is simply this. Just tell the Lord right now, God, I confess to you that I'm a sinner. Just tell Him. I confess to you that I'm a sinner, that I'm separated from you. I'm willing to repent of my sin and turn away from it. And I'm willing to surrender my life to you because I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. And I believe He resurrected. And I receive you as Lord and a Savior. Let me ask you something. If there's anyone here tonight that prayed that prayer or needs to pray that prayer, would you just lift your head up and open your eyes up and look at me? Come on, anyone here tonight? Anyone? Just look at me. Just look at me. Just say, just look at me. Now I'm going to ask you here in a minute, if you prayed that prayer, to just step down the front. I'm going to ask Brady to come down front and stand down here. If you pray that prayer and you receive Christ, your personal Savior, I'm going to ask you to come. Now for the rest of us as Christians, how many of us would admit tonight that we need to renew our vows to Christ? We need to renew our relationship to Christ. That we've been complacent way too long and callous in our heart way too long. We've been too distracted and too busy with everything else but the main thing, which is Christ. Come on. How many of us tonight would admit that, man, I need to renew my relationship to Christ. I need to surrender. Not that I get resaved. That's not what this is talking about. That's not what this is all. But, Lord, I, tonight I need you to awaken me and take, take this sin off me, this burden that I've been carrying for so long, God. I, I need to release that because I want to live in full victory with you, God. I want my life to be reflective of you in everything I do as Lord and Master and Savior. Listen, if that's you, I want you to open your eyes up and look at me. Come on. If you need to renew that relationship tonight, come on, open your eyes up. Look at me. Look at me. And just here in a moment, why don't you come down? I want you to step down here in a moment and just tell Brady, Brady, I really need to make sure that my life, my relationship is right. Maybe God's calling you to come because someone else is watching you and they're going to go, man, you know what? I need to do the same thing. But as long as we sit, look, I'm not saying that God's calling all of us out tonight. God's calling all of us to follow Him. But tonight, specifically, God's calling some of us to come forward. I invite you to do that. If you're receiving Christ tonight, you come forward. You walk up to Brady and say, I need Jesus. If you're renewing your relationship with Him tonight, maybe you've been that toxically religious person. And, and tonight, you need an awakening in your soul. And God brought you here tonight to refresh you. So please, tonight, don't turn that away. Young person, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, any of us. Let God move in us. I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to step out of the way and I'm going to let Brady come over here and stand in the front. And you come right now. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask right now that you lead this church. Lead this invitation. Draw people to yourself, Father. Lord, I know it's really hard to step out in front of others and people that know us. But God, tonight, I pray you'll give us the strength and the wisdom and the courage to step out and do the right thing for the young people here so that they can be the example for their school wherever they go, that their friends can know Jesus. For those of us who are older, Father, so the people at work can know, so our neighbors can know, so our family 
can know, Father, so that we can be those witnesses because, God, we will never have revival in our nation or in our community till we first have revival right inside this tent. So, Father, tonight we ask that's what you do. All for your glory, Father. Draw us to yourself. Awaken us tonight, Father, to follow you for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand up right now? And as you do, step out and come right now. Brady's going to stand here. He's going to receive you. Come on right now. Come on, guys. Some of you lifted your eyes and you said you prayed that prayer. Some of you know tonight you need to come. Why don't you come right now? Come see Brady. One of the most, one of the most beautiful aspects of the gospel is not the fact that it just applies to teenagers. It doesn't just apply to people that play guitar or sing songs or that can smash the drums like crazy. It applies to anyone who is a sinner. Scripture says in Romans 3, for all have fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6 says, for the wages of sin is death and not just a physical death, but a spiritual death. And that death is not just one of, okay, it's gone, but it's actually a place of eternal judgment and torment forever. And the beautiful gospel, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Wheeler, Dr. Wheeler, for bringing the word for us that shows us the truth that you're either okay with God or not okay with God. There, you don't get to walk the fence, you know? If you guys know anything about property lines, the fence exists on someone's property. It doesn't just exist in the middle. So if you're walking on the fence, you're on somebody's property. If you haven't made your decision and you're like, hey, I'm on the fence, what's gonna happen is Christ is gonna come back for his people. You're gonna still be on the fence. God's gonna take his people, Satan's gonna take his, and Satan's gonna walk back out to the fence and say, come on, you're on my property. There's no middle ground. There's no gray area. You're either in the black or you're in the white. The black is death and the white is life. And that white is only accessible through the blood of Jesus. If you need to have a conversation tonight, which we as a church urge you to do, there are people all around here with these little name badges that would love to earnestly pray for you. One of my favorite verses in scripture is uh, Hebrews 13, eight. It says, it's simple, it's short, it's beautiful. If you struggle memorizing scripture, you need to memorize this. Hebrews 13, eight says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the same, the same savior that came 2000 years ago, the same one who had his mind on you even 2000 years ago, before you were conceived, he had his eyes on you. Never lose sight of God because he's never lost sight of you. Will you pray with me now? Lord, thank you for the truth of the gospel. Lord, thank you for its supremacy. Thank you for the power that it holds. Romans 1.16 says, for the power, the gospel is the power of salvation to any who would believe. Anyone who would submit their life to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus now has eternal life in the name of the Father. Their name is now secured. Their hand is now, they are, their life is now held in the hand of God. And God, we know from your truth that hand will never let us go. You hold fast to us. And Lord, even though we may fail you, you will never fail us. Even though we may fall short, you will never fall short. Even though we may succumb to sin, you sent Jesus who never succumbed to sin. He was the perfect sacrifice for us. And we thank you for this blessed truth. Lord, I pray over everyone here, myself included, that we would remember the passage from 1 John chapter 1 that says this. For anyone who confesses their sin unto the Lord, that he is faithful and just to forgive them of their sin and iniquity all the time. Not 25% of the time, not 35% of the time, but 100% of the time, if we confess our sin to the Lord, he is faithful and just to forgive us. And Psalms 27, four says, I seek to dwell in the house of the Lord for the rest of my days. I pray that that would be the conviction over everyone here that every day as we go into life, not just on a Sunday, but every day on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we would have that conviction to be in the presence of you for that is where hope and life eternal is forevermore. We pray this in the name of Jesus, amen. Technically you're dismissed, but we urge you to have these conversations that you feel the Lord is pressing you towards. We as a church exist here in Amherst County to be here for you. You're not just a number. You're not just some person that 
phases in and phases out, but you are a son and daughter of God. And remember, for those of you who are believers in this space, you are sent on mission. Have a blessed night.